In July of 2012, physicists at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN announced the discovery of a brand new particle, the Higgs boson. And this was extremely exciting to the physicists and to the many, many people following the event. But it was also a challenge to the physicists because they had to explain why the Higgs boson was such a big deal. And we've discovered plenty of particles before, but the Higgs boson is something special. The particle itself is actually not that important. What's important is this field filling empty space. And the Higgs boson particle is just a little vibration in the field. So you may be familiar with the idea that a photon, the particle that carries light, is a vibration in the electric and magnetic fields that fill space. It turns out that all particles are like that. That really the world isn't made of particles, it's made of fields, which means that there's something called the Higgs field, something called the electromagnetic field, something called the electron field, the top quark field, etc. Which means that at every point in space, there's a number that says, what is the value of the electric field at this point in space? What is the value of the neutrino field? And so forth. And it's that Higgs field filling space that affects all of the particles that move through it. That's why the Higgs boson is so important. But particle physicists generally don't talk about the fact that the world is ultimately made of fields. We talk about particles, we talk about quantum mechanics, we talk about relativity in black holes. But for the first time, now that we talk about the Higgs boson and we're trying to explain it, we physicists are going to have to take seriously the idea that the universe is made of fields and explain to the rest of the world what that really means. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN is the world's largest particle accelerator. In fact, it's the world's largest machine of any sort. And when it turned on in 2008, there was one particle that we were pretty sure we were going to find. At least, we thought it was more likely than not that this particle, the Higgs boson, would be there. And now we think we've found it. But the question is, what else could be there? There are many, many candidates for other things we can find at the LHC, but none of them is a guarantee. None of them is definitely going to be there. So we've gone beyond the more likely than not particles, and we're moving on to the speculative particles. There could be supersymmetric particles. There could be particles that reflect a new symmetry of nature relating matter particles to force particles. There could be evidence for extra dimensions of space. If extra dimensions are actually curled up very, very tiny, particles zooming around those extra dimensions would show up as heavier particles at the Large Hadron Collider. And probably most likely of all, there's the idea of dark matter. Dark matter, at least, we know it exists. The astronomers have given us evidence that there is dark matter in the universe. We don't know what particle it is. We know that it's none of the particles we found yet. So there has to be a new particle making up the dark matter. If we're lucky, we'll either find it directly or at least find some evidence for its existence as the Large Hadron Collider keeps running. Symmetry is a great notion for physicists because what it means is that you can do something, you can transform a system somehow, and the results of your physics experiment shouldn't matter. So if you're you know, measuring the strength of gravity in your laboratory, and someone says, you know, rotate the whole apparatus 90 degrees, sort of so it's facing east instead of facing north, you should get the same answer, right? I mean, the strength of gravity doesn't matter how you orient your apparatus. So that's a symmetry to physicists. You can change the system somehow, and the underlying physics doesn't change. But it's gone far beyond that in particle physics and quantum field theory, where we have all these particles, all these fields filling space, and we have symmetries that relate them to each other. The genius of the Higgs field is that it hides symmetry from us. So now that we know that the Higgs field is there, we know there's more symmetry in nature than we easily see. And that means there could be a lot more symmetry than we've ever seen. So the hunt is on for yet more symmetries underlying the particles and forces of nature. Particle physics is expensive. What we're doing is we're trying to create particles that are very, very heavy. That's a lot of mass. And to create a lot of mass, you need a lot of energy. And it costs money. So the Large Hadron Collider at CERN cost about $9 billion. There was a competitor to the LHC, the Superconducting Super Collider, planned for the United States. It got off the ground in the 1980s, and then in 1993, the US Congress decided it was costing too much money, this is not worth it, we have hungry mouths to feed, and they just canceled it. So the LHC went forward, discovered the Higgs boson, got all the glory. The next question is, what will be the successor to the LHC? And the real question is, will there even be a successor to the LHC? If the LHC is $9 billion, the next next one is going to be more than $10 billion. That's a lot of money to discover particles that no person will ever individually see. 
Uh, it's worth it in the sense that there's only a small number of fundamental features of reality that there are to discover. And this is part of a quest that has been going on for thousands of years. But you need to convince countries and governments and people that this is worth spending money on. So the particle physics community has a plan. They have what's called the International Linear Collider. Different countries would love to be the host. Nobody would love to pay for it. So it's going to be interesting to see what new particles the Large Hadron Collider discovers because that might help us decide whether and what kind of particle accelerators will be built within our lifetimes. I was one of those very lucky kids who discovered what they want to do for a living at a very young age. I was more or less 10 years old when I started reading books. Uh, I was not good at doing experiments or anything like that, which is why I should not have become an experimentalist, which I didn't. But I love reading books and struggling with the ideas. I read about quarks and leptons and black holes and the Big Bang and quantum mechanics and relativity, and I wanted to do that. I didn't know what that meant. When you're 10 years old, you don't know there's such a thing as a professor or a graduate school or anything like that. But apparently, there were people who thought about these ideas for a living, and most physicists are not theoretical physicists, and most of them are not elementary particle physicists or cosmologists. Most physicists work with atoms and materials and plasmas and things you can touch and move around. I work with where the universe came from, why the universe exists at all, what are the laws that govern the evolution of the universe from its very beginning to today to the far, far future. So it's a very exciting thing. It's a very tiny number of people who sort of get paid to professionally think about the ultimate nature of reality. I'm Sean Carroll. I'm a theoretical physicist at Caltech in Pasadena, California.